Um, well, I wanted to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Um, our guest speaker, his name is Adam Block. He's the preaching pastor at Ridgeview Christian Church, uh, where my wife and I attend. Um, and I've really enjoyed in the past couple years uh, learning under him and, and learning through his preaching. And uh, part of the reason I invited him to come speak tonight is because I've seen over a couple years now his devotion to God's Word and his devotion to preaching God's Word faithfully. Um, and it could never hurt to get some bonus points with your preacher by bringing him in to speak, maybe. So, an extra star in the crown. An extra star in the crown from the preacher. That's, that's... I will give you an extra indulgence. An extra indulgence. Oh, okay. All right. Without further ado, <laughs> we'll bring Adam up here. Make sure to thank him on, on, on his way out for uh, coming and spending his time to, to preach for us tonight. So... Okay, so how can you get a bunch of preachers to get in a fight with each other? Doctrine. What? Doctrine. Yes, exactly. Really easily, actually. Uh, so I am a doctorate student, and the last class I was in is called Developing a Culturally Sensitive Ministry, which means it was the hot button class. All sorts of cultural hot button issues we're like all pretty much in agreement on. But then we get to this one certain issue, and now there's like raising of voices and like people scooting away from each other and glaring at each other across the room. And to get in this program, you have to have at least three years of ministry experience after you finish your graduate degree. And so it's not like these are all a bunch of like, you know, like young pups all just fighting amongst themselves. No, these are like actual ministers, things like that, because you have to be in ministry too to be in the specific doctorate program. And guess what topic made them all start getting angry at each other? Spiritual gifts. No, not spiritual gifts. Predestination. Not predestination. No, we're mostly in agreement in the group that's in that room, I think. This issue that I get to preach for you all tonight about, women in ministry and women in the church. Yay! So... Uh, I understand you're in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we are in chapter 14 today. If you would like to open there, uh, open your apps or open your real Bibles and turn to verse 26 is where we'll be starting, and we will read verse 26 through the end of the chapter. This is definitely a hot-button passage because it doesn't just cover women either. It also covers spiritual gifts too, the one in particular. And so we get to talk all about that. Uh, and so, yeah, unfortunately, this is not really a passage I can preach. It's a passage I have to teach. There is a slight difference, and we're just going to have to deal with that because of the nature of this passage, because everybody likes to fight each other over this. If you don't know about the fights that have to do this passage, that's great. Don't ask about them. <laughs> so uh, I will read the passage from 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 40. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two, or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church, and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged, and the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets." For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual... He should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. Thanks, Nathaniel. <laughs> Wherever he is, he's probably gone now. Oh, okay, now he's waving. Okay, so I just read to you, as I've said, one of the most controversial passages in the Bible, at least in the New Testament. Uh, one, of, one of the most hotly debated ones, probably. Not only does this passage concern speaking in tongues, which starts fights, as I said, uh, it also talks about, or it, it's, it is the Apostle Paul 
who is pretty much the greatest missionary of the first century. Uh, he's probably the greatest missionary of the Christian faith. He's the author of most of the New Testament books. He's a man inspired by the Holy Spirit to write, Women, shut up. That's, that's what it sounds like he says, right? Uh, that, that, that's one interpretation here. He says, Women should keep silent in the churches, and it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now we get to talk about that. So, uh, here's the deal. I don't know what hermeneutical methods, you use a hermeneutic as a method of interpreting the Bible. So my hermeneutical method is that I take what the Bible says at its word, at what it seems to just be logically saying just from there, unless there's a textual reason to not. And when I say textual reason, I mean something within the verses themselves, a textual reason. So the text is the verses there. And when the Bible basically says women shut up, that should make some of us pause for a second, right? Uh, because I want to take the Bible at its word. Don't you? Hopefully most Christians do. Uh, but then you got to go, are women really supposed to be silent in the church? So I figure I've got two giant cans of worms to talk about today. Uh, let me start off by saying you can have differences of opinion, I think, on everything I'm going to talk about tonight, pretty much. You can, you can have different views than I'm going to present, and I still can call you a brother or sister in Christ, and I'm not like... Just saying it so you won't fight me. Like, you can't have different views. You'll be wrong, but you, no. Uh, I really do think my views are accurate, else I wouldn't be presenting them. But I do think you can have different views on uh, the subject we're going to talk about, on speaking in tongues and women in the church. And so uh, here's also an important rule, a very important rule, I think, for biblical interpretation. And that is you are not allowed, as a, as a good Christian, as a good student of the Bible, to say, this passage is hard to swallow so it probably doesn't mean that, right? Like that should be a good rule. All because a passage is hard to put into practice doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And so if there's a passage that's like, whoa, that's crazy heavy, that doesn't mean you need to go find another interpretation. And so we can do that with a whole lot of passages. This is, this is one passage that, that we have to look at. That. You, can't, you can't say that this is a different biblical interpretation because it sounds really hard to do. Uh, it's not, bec not because you just wish the Bible said something different. There's a whole lot of passages, and we're getting into trouble in a lot of churches, I think, because you look at a passage that says something clearly, and it's, well, I really wish it said something different. And so then we do hermeneutical gymnastics to try and figure out what else it could possibly say instead of what it says there. Uh, hopefully I won't do hermeneutical gymnastics tonight, uh, but does that make sense, that rule, that all because it's hard to swallow doesn't mean you should change the interpretation? Okay, good. Uh, I also want to step back and say, let's not miss the forest while we are looking at the trees, because there are a lot of controversial issues in this passage, but the actual like overall meaning, the overarching umbrella meaning, the forest meaning of this passage is super easy. It's like not hard whatsoever. It says it three times, point blank in the text. It says, let all things be done for building up. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, and all things should be done decently and in order speaking about church services when the church gathers in particular. And so three times we get this note that church is supposed to not be chaotic. That's the overarching meaning of this passage. That's, that's, the, that's the umbrella uh, covering this whole thing. And so no matter what personal conclusion we come to about speaking in tongues or women in the church, uh, things like that, we should all hopefully, because it says it three times, uh, that, we should, that God wants services to be done decently and without chaos. The gathering of Christians should be a time of peace and be a time of clarity. That's the goal for when Christians gather there. I think the phrase, if you're in the outline and you version, I think I said it, church should be orderly as the main point of this passage. I don't like that phrase because it sounds very like, blah, church should be orderly. That sounds exciting. Um, but maybe another, another way to say is church should be easy, but that doesn't, that's not accurate either. So something along those lines, church should not be chaotic, but that is not so catchy. And so, uh, but regardless, that's the main point. Don't lose the forest while looking at the trees. Does that make sense so far? Good. All right, so let's talk about speaking in tongues uh, because that's very peaceful and clar clarity, right? Uh, I'll reread the first few verses just looking for this idea and then we'll, we'll talk about that. I'll talk about it. Uh, back in verse 26 again. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. 
Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And I'll stop there, and we'll talk about the verse break there, non-verse break there in a minute. Uh, This passage is not just about speaking in tongues, right? I mean, that's hopefully clear enough. It's about any kind of public speech when Christians get together as a worship service. So it's not just speaking in tongues. It talks about prophecy. It talks about revelation. It talks about even singing songs uh, together. It says people should come to church prepared to do one of those things, to either either give a revelation or or to speak in a tongue or to sing. And aren't you so glad it, it says sing in there? So that means you don't have to come prepared to speak in tongues or give a revelation. You're allowed to just show up to sing, right? Uh, that makes, that's like, whoo, I am so glad for that sometimes. Uh, but all of it should be done for building up the church. That's what all of it should be done for. Uh, the passage, though, specifically puts limitations on a few things, uh, such as speaking in tongues. Uh, some of the limitations are only one speaking that way at a time. Someone should only speak in tongues if someone can interpret, and only two or three at most. That uh, change, that, that's some rules there. Uh, those, I think, are pretty clear in this passage. Uh, some things that are unclear, though, are what is revelation when you're talking about a church gathering together? Are all believers supposed to get a turn during church to potentially teach? Because if so, we're doing it very wrong nowadays, right? Uh, who are the others that are supposed to judge whether or not prophecy is good? Who are those people? It does, it's not clear on that. Uh, the other question is, do, do the Old Testament rules on prophecy still apply? That's a question I have. Do you know what the Old Testament rules on prophecy are? Or a prophet in general? If he ever gets a single prophecy wrong ever, you take him out back and stone him until he's dead? That's the Old Testament rules on prophets. And so, if you ever follow one of those prophets, that people that claim to be prophets, and they ever get like, when Jesus is going to come back wrong, don't ever listen to him again. Right? I don't think you should kill him. Just... Where you live in the New Testament age, right? There's more grace, maybe. Uh, but don't, don't listen to them anymore. They predict the future and it's wrong. That's the biblical standard uh, there. A lot of those questions that you have in this text, I think, get cleared up when we start to define terms a little better. Uh, for example, prophecy. What do you think about when you hear the word prophecy? Anybody? You think of like predicting the future sometimes, right? Okay, so how often, what percentage do you think of Old Testament prophecy was predicting the future? Just guess. What? 24. 24. 25. The biggest estimate of Old Testament prophecy being predictive is 5%. So 95% of what prophets said in the Old Testament was not predictive of the future whatsoever. If you read through it, it's just not. And so that instantly changes how we have to think about prophecy, right? Also, how many prophets were there in the Old Testament? Were there only like as many as books as we have in the Bible, or were there a whole lot more? There are a whole lot more. And so there's just some clarifying things there. All because you speak prophecy doesn't necessarily mean you're like speaking the words of God. Now, I think that's sometimes what prophecy means, definitely the ones that are recorded for us in scriptures. But if someone has like the gift of prophecy per se, what prophecy really just means is you are revealing what God wants someone else to know, which could very easily be done by just quoting scripture to someone, right? Uh, Prophecy in general is the idea of, you know, I really, there's a song I think you should hear, or, you know, there's this verse I've been thinking about, or even just saying, hey, how are you doing? And one time I said, hey, how are you doing? And a guy broke down crying because he needed to be asked that general question one time. It was really weird. Uh, but that's sort of, that can be under the umbrella of prophecy, is you just sharing something with someone else that God says they need to hear. And that can be prophecy. It doesn't need to be like special words of the Lord. It doesn't, also, it doesn't have to be comparable with Scripture. And so there's, there's that much there. Uh, prophecy just means passing along what God wants his people to hear. There's also, uh, we need to clarify the word tongue as well. Uh, The Greek word for tongue is the exact same Greek word for the word language. So I think we would get a whole lot less confusion in the scriptures if we would translate the word the same way across the board and just translate languages. And so speaking in languages is what is actually talked about uh, here. Wouldn't that translation make more sense if you think of the ancient Near Eastern context when everyone and their brother spoke three to five languages? And now that makes a whole lot more sense of a whole lot of the passage. There's still some passages that sounds like maybe 
maybe something else is going on. But I think you can explain most everything a lot more easily. Not saying there's special divine languages, but a lot of times when it's talking about tongues, it's just speaking about somebody speaking in Spanish or some other language uh, back then. Which doesn't that make sense then why there needs to be a translator in the room? Right? Because they need to translate that. It also makes sense for evangelism. If somebody's like, hey, I've got my sister's cousin's brother from my hometown, they're visiting and they're going to come to church with me. I want to go ahead and speak in the language that they'll understand a whole lot better. Because everyone speaks trade languages, but he, everyone's better at their native tongue, a whole lot more than they are with trade languages. So hang on, let me interpret for him this other language. Would that make more sense of this passage, perhaps? I think. At least I hope. Uh, that, that's how I get it. It also lines up better with what happened at the day of Pentecost, right? The day of Pentecost, what did the non-believers who, when they heard them speak in the language, say? Whoa, these guys are speaking in our own languages. And so sometimes speaking in tongues means speaking in the language of the people who they can understand better. Uh, I think that, that's something that works very well in this passage. Now, Paul also says, as a clarifying thing, the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets, that means that the people who undergo these things are not losing control of themselves. They have control of their faculties when this sort of thing happens. It's not like they're losing control and going uh, crazy uh, there. And Paul says things like take turns, let others share, don't lose control of yourself, make sure that everyone speaking is able to be understood because that's how we do church services. That's what Paul sent a letter to the Corinthians with. Uh, that, that's how I interpret uh, this passage here. Uh, and then also there's the thankfully we... Can not have to, we don't have to teach when we get there. We can just sing along as well. Uh, so that's, that's the first part there. I don't know how many people I've offended so far. I don't think I've pushed buttons too hard there. Um, but uh, what's the, the next part? There is the woman passage, right? The, the woman part. And before we go on to that, I need to clarify one thing because it'll make sense later. I need to point out that phrase, let the others weigh in on what was said. Uh, weigh in can mean test or it can mean interrogate there. So let the others interrogate people during church. That'd be interesting, right? Uh, it literally means to distinguish or differentiate between. That's what the word is. And so what he's saying there is if someone's teaching and getting up to speak, others are allowed to figure out if what they're teaching is good or not. That's what he's saying. But he doesn't clarify who the others are. And it seems like maybe it's a specific group of people. I don't know. Um, and so people who are willing to stand up, share their languages or share their prophecy, share their revelation to the church, they're allowed to be questioned. And that's even expected, it seems like. Uh, specifically, it was determined whether or not they were sharing what God wanted them to share. And Paul says that the others are allowed to do that questioning. I don't think that's everybody in the room, because that would be a bit chaotic, wouldn't it? And what's the whole overarching purpose of the passage? Don't let things get out of hand. Don't let it get chaotic. That's what he's saying. And so I think the others is a specific group of people. Who are they? We don't know. It does not clarify whatsoever. Uh, my educated guess that I really don't have time to, to explain uh, tonight is that it's actually specifically talking about elders, in particular the church elders. And so that's, I think, what it is saying here, that the elders are supposed to question what is said. And we do that nowadays a lot more behind closed doors because in today's society, that would be very chaotic, wouldn't it, if the elders got up and started questioning the preacher? And so uh, that's more of, that's what, like, elders meetings and stuff are for, or bad meetings that you have after Sunday morning services that no one in the church knows about, just the preacher. Uh, things like that. Uh, I thankfully haven't, thankfully haven't had one of those with the elders. I've had those with just church members, so uh, we're all good. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I don't have time to get into the reasons why I think it's elders. I just do. That's my, that's my educated guess, and that'll, I'll bring that up later as we get further along. Uh, so now we get to talk about women being silent in church, right? It's exciting. Um, the first time I actually heard that passage read aloud is when I went to a church camp and we went in the boys' dorm and the oldest guy in the group stood up and read that passage really loud and proud because we were in the boys' dorm. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, before, before we move on, does anyone like need to stretch, go take a restroom break until I'm done teaching? Or, okay. All right, I'm going to reread the verses. I'm going to start halfway through verse 33 because that's where I think the paragraph break is. Paragraph breaks, sentence breaks... Uh, periods, punctuation, those did not exist at the time of the New Testament. Uh, the verse numbers that were added were not added until the Middle Ages. And so it was just long strings of words unbroken, like there weren't even spaces originally either. And so uh, it's, it's a little bit different. It is hotly debated, actually, which 
which sentence the phrase as in all the churches of the saints should belong with. If you have the NIV, I believe it puts it with the preceding paragraph. If you have the ESV, it puts it with the next paragraph. And it's basically the, tri the translators have to make a decision because we have punctuation. They didn't back then. And so it's kind of up to the translators to pick which one it goes to. It really is about 50-50 among scholars as to whether or not it goes with the previous passage or the next passage. And so it's the, this way in my preferred translation, so that's what we're sticking with uh, for the night. So verse 33b through 35. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. So without doing any interpretation, what does it sound like Paul's saying? How dare you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it sounds like he's saying, right? It sounds like he's saying, when you're in church, women do not talk. That's what all churches do. It is shameful if you open your mouth. Like, that's... That's what it sounds like it's saying. And my hermeneutical method is when the Bible sounds like it's saying something, I stick with that, unless I have a textual reason uh, to, do, to not do so. Uh, it really sounds like Paul is kind of mansplaining uh, here. But the problem is the, the Bible's not sexist, though. It's not. It actually elevates women extremely highly above, like, every single culture that ever existed at the time and pretty much still exists today. The Bible puts women on a higher plane than most all cultures do. Uh, it really does elevate women. And so what in the world is going on with Paul's words uh, here? Uh, and so let's look at the idea of textual reasons to come up with other interpretations uh, here. When I say textual reason, I mean like context. I mean figures of speech. I mean quotations or narrative styles, things like that. Here's an example. Uh, many parts of the book of Job are wrong. They're terribly wrong. Like most of the book of Job. Does that sound weird when I say that? It's because at the end of the book, what happens? God shows up and is like, no. Yeah, God shows up and is like, yeah, everything your friends just said, which was almost the entire book, was them talking. There you have no idea. Don't do that. Like that's, and so most of the book of Job is wrong. But the whole book of Job is right. Right? And so you can see other things. Another example, uh, when Jesus speaks in parables, is Jesus telling us historical stories with all the details exactly to be believed as they actually happened that way? Or is Jesus telling truthful stories and he's using the details and making them up to make bigger points? That's most of the time when Jesus is speaking parables, right? And so uh, there can be reasons to decide that the plain meaning of text is not the real meaning of text. There are ways to look at that, but there are rules to it. It's not just like, yeah, I don't feel like that, so there's probably some other way to interpret this. And so knowing that there could be rules, let's look at how some people choose to interpret this passage. Uh, here, I'm going to list them all that I know of, and I'm going to point out what I think works and what doesn't work. And so first, here's, here's the fun one. There are people who don't believe these verses belong in Scripture at all. This is the biggest textual action, as in like the word text, textual reason uh, that people don't think that Paul is saying women shut up. Uh, because there are a few ancient manuscripts that include verses 34 and 35 after verse 40. Why would the verses move in some manuscripts? Like a manuscript is like an ancient copy of the Bible before we came up with the printing press. So why would some of them have it in a different spot? Because they skipped it on accident? or Yeah, so that's the theory that some people have is that... So here's one. Some people think it's actually put in the margins because someone was trying to explain, oh yeah, I don't like women. And someone after them came along and went, oh, is that a margin or is that part of it? Because actually you look at some of the ancient copies, it's a very smushed and there's not much margin space. space. And so they, they decided, oh, let's put that there. But then some people saw that later and put it in a different spot because it was in the margin. That's the theory there. There are major problems with this theory though. Uh, for example, we have no copies ever of a manuscript without these two verses. Now, there are instances where verses were added into Scripture later. Like if you read your King James Bible and compare it with an NIV Bible, you will find like five or ten or so, I think it's like seven or eight, uh, verses that are not in the NIV that are in the King James. Why? They remove from the book and now their names will be removed from the book of life? That's what some King James only people will teach. But no, they, these people are saying, well, you added to the book, which is just as bad of a curse. Uh, so 
there are a few verses that were added. What's cool is we have so many manuscripts now that we can pinpoint most of them to the year that they were added. Like, okay, that verse was added in like 1066. We know exactly when that happened. We have enough manuscripts to do that now, which is really cool. But we didn't have that many when the King James Version was translated. They, had, they didn't have as good of manuscripts then. And so there are just some extra verses that aren't really verses. They're things that didn't belong in the Bible anyway. And some people are saying, this is what happened with this woman shut up passage. That's the first kind of a way to attack this passage. But the, as I said, all of the ones that have it in a different spot, all can be traced back to one source. And that source has other problems. We know the editor who made that, the guy who actually wrote that manuscript, made lots of mistakes in other places. And that's one cool thing, too, about having so many ancient manuscripts of the Greek uh, New Testament, is that we like, can say, well, that guy actually wasn't very good at his job. And, <laughs> and so we, we have enough to be able to do that. And so we know that that guy who caused that transcript error that ended up getting brought to some of that transcript's children, it's, it wasn't very good. And so... Um, the oldest, cop, the oldest ones we have are the ones where they have the verses where they are. We have no, none that are missing those verses, so these verses, I think, really do belong. Uh, you will hear sometimes, though, people make that argument if you get down to the nitty-gritty and look at this. Most scholars go, I would love it if this verse didn't belong, but it does. It would make our job so much easier, right? Uh, there would be a whole lot less fighting if these verses didn't belong, but they do. They, they just do, but you will hear that uh, being talked about. Uh, before. A uh, second way of getting around the plain meaning of Scripture is some believe that Paul is quoting the Corinthians and he's telling them why they are wrong. That, that's one way of, of looking at this. Uh, there are a small, very small handful of biblical scholars who take this view. Uh, it's a very convenient view because now you don't have to worry about like some, some conspiracy theory about verses getting added to the Bible. Now you just, hey, the Corinthians were sexist. Like that makes it a whole lot more convenient, right? Uh, we know that this could work because quotation marks didn't exist back then when the Bible was written, and so he could have been quoting the Corinthians. That's possible. Uh, he does quote the Corinthians, it seems like, a few times throughout the book of Corinthians, but then it seems like he also makes very clear, he makes very clear cases when that happens. Uh, the problem is with context. Uh, he makes it clear, he doesn't make it clear in this passage. The context of this verse, regardless of whether or not you think that part of verse 33 goes with the preceding paragraph, the next paragraph... That verse, as in all the churches of the saints, and then two sentences later, where it says, if anyone does not recognize, recognize this, he is not recognized, does that sound like Paul's saying, that's wrong? I don't, I don't think so. So I don't think Paul is calling this out as bad teaching uh, here. So I don't buy that argument. A third potential view, this one is the most popular view. Uh, it is not the most scholarly view, like scholarly accepted view, I mean, but it is the most popular one. And that's that this, this woman shut up thing is just a culturally time-limited command for the Corinthian church in that day because women, because of their sexist culture, were uneducated and or there were particular women that Paul was talking about and those particular women need to stop talking during church. Have you ever like, had a woman that you wish would stop talking so much during <laughs> church? And some people are thinking that's what Paul was saying. That's the idea there. That's, that's one way of interpreting this. So, that, so a few years down the road, this verse is useless now. That's, that's one way to take a look at this. What's the problem with that view, though? That phrase, as in all the churches, that doesn't sound like he's saying, yeah, this church in particular has a problem. And then the couple sentences later again where he says that phrase, yeah, if you don't accept this teaching, you're not accepted. That doesn't sound like a culturally bound kind of issue, I don't think. Uh, but that is kind of the most popular uh, view there. And so what do we do with these verses that tell women to be silent in the churches? Do we tell women they can no longer teach Sunday school classes? Do we tell women not to shush their babies when their babies cry during church? Because that's not being silent if you shush, is it? Uh, do, you, do you tell them to stop singing during worship songs? Because that's not being silent. So what do you do? It also, it also gets more complicated when you start to think about the idea of church as a concept. When does church stop and now women are allowed to start talking again? Is it after the okay, go home song? Is it when they pass by the security guard greeters? Uh, is it when they cross the threshold? When are women allowed to start talking again? When does church stop? Because if you look in the New Testament, what, who is the church or where is the church? It's, it's homes and not just that. It's any time you've got a group of Christians gathered together for any purpose whatsoever. That's the church. 
And so anytime like two women walk up, suddenly they're the church. Are they supposed to stop talking to each other? <laughs> so what do you do with this passage? Uh, here, it gets really confusing uh, when, you, when you're trying to enact the plain meaning of this text, especially when you go back three chapters. Let's go back three chapters at 1 Corinthians, and now women are commanded to pray and prophesy, but just only if they're standing alone, right? It doesn't say that there. Uh, it does put some qualifiers on that, but it still says it's supposed to be happening there. And so what is going on? Then you also, if you look at Romans chapter 16, and we're not going to turn all these passages right now. Uh, because I think I'm going to be pushing it for time. I don't know. Uh, I have no idea what time it is now. Uh, but if you look at Romans 16, the, one of the only named deacons in the entire Bible is a woman. Actually, arguably the only named one, depending on how you interpret a couple other things, is a woman, a deacon. Uh, if you go to Acts chapter 21, we see there's a group of women who are prophets. If you notice First, First Peter and Revelation, all believers, regardless of gender, are called priests in the kingdom of God. And so what do you do with all of this here? But women are supposed to be silent in the churches. I'm of the opinion that people usually aren't crazy. And if Paul, let's give him the benefit of a doubt, that if he says one thing within a few pages, turns of it, that contradict each other, like, hey, women should pray and prophesy, oh, women be silent during the churches, let's give him the benefit of the doubt that he's not crazy. Like, because that's what you do with any, the average person you walk up. Until they give you reasons to think they're crazy, let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. And so if Paul's not crazy, we have to start interpreting this. That's what I mean by a textual reason to interpret something besides the plain meaning of the text. Uh, but here's the thing, though. The fact of the matter is that Paul is teaching something. This is, this is the point where, like, I've read so many books on this issue at this point. Uh, because I've been in several classes on these sorts of things, like hot-button issue classes. They're very popular in Bible colleges. Uh, but a lot of the books that are pro-women doing ministry will read these passages and then stop right there and be like, well, it, it, it contradicts this, so that means it can't be what it teaches. And then my question is, so what is he teaching? But most of the books don't cover that is, is my problem with it. Uh, there's one book that just came out a few months ago. It's a good book, but it stops short of that. I'm like, okay, so what is Paul teaching now? Because he's doing something, right? Like, Scripture's not useless. What does the Bible say about itself? What is God's Word? It's actually extremely useful and does not return void. And so what is the meaning of this passage? How do we interpret uh, these verses? Well, we use context, I think. Um, we, we look for the context. Here's, here's an easy way to say that the, the plain meaning of the text, which sounds like women shut up during church, that's what it sounds like it's saying. Women aren't allowed to speak. They always have to be quiet. An easy way to get around that without having to do hermeneutical gymnastics, I think, is saying, what if Paul is saying that women should keep silent in the church just on one specific point? That would like fix a whole lot of the issues, right? Because you have to agree, either Paul is contradicting himself and scripture contradicts itself, or he's limiting this scope of women be silent in the churches. Right? Or it's a logical problem because when do women have to stop talking and get to start again? And so um, if you say that it's just a particular topic, that would fix a lot of confusion. And if you want to take that route, which I think is the best route to take, or else we have to say the Bible's contradictory, or else we have to say the logic makes no sense. Um, and so if you go that way, you can't just pick a topic out of a hat, can you? Like, that's not how you do Bible interpretation. How do you find a topic to pick? That's the hard part of this. And I go with context. What is the most recent type of speech that was brought up? If women are to be silent, he's talking about speech in the church. What's the most recent speech discussed in the text? Speaking tongues, prophecy is included. But it is not just that. The most direct, the, most, the closest fallback to it is questioning the preacher. Right? Not necessarily the preacher. It's questioning who's ever prophesying or speaking in tongues or giving revelation. Uh, it's questioning that. It's bringing up those questions and interrogating the person in the room. It's the let others weigh in on what is said. That is the most recent thing mentioned in the scriptures. That's the most recent thing there. And so I find it also interesting that Paul specifically mentions the wife asking her husband at home. And so what if Paul is not telling all women to shut up? Or what if he's talking about whether or not they publicly judge someone else's prophecy? What if that's what he's doing? Then suddenly you don't have to have like the the contradictory stuff. You don't have to figure out, okay, when do women have to start and stop talking? Uh, when are the boundaries there? Uh, I think uh, 
I think that makes sense to me. That's, that's option one for how to interpret this. Option one uh, is that he's talking about publicly judging someone else's prophecy and questioning them during the church service. Uh, that option makes sense to me, especially if, as I mentioned earlier, the others are the elders. Uh, because the elders, as we see elsewhere, their role is kind of to judge things going on in the church and to maintain leadership over that and make sure it's doctrinal. And elsewhere in Scripture, I do think that eldership is restricted only to men. That's, I'm not going to go there right now because just we don't have time to cover that. Uh, but there is, there is another hot-button issue quest verse that I think that's the interpretation of that, is that eldership is restricted just to men. And let's not argue about that, let's just move on. Um, but so I don't think Paul is saying women, all, all women stop talking in the church in general, don't ever speak again in services. I think it could be just saying that women can't have the eldership job of questioning whether or not someone's teaching doctrinally sound things or not during the service. They could probably question at home because he actually mentions that and bring that up and be like, well, was that right? But they shouldn't be doing that during the church service in particular when the church is gathered. Option two might make even more sense, but I go back and forth on which one makes more sense. Option two actually picks up on the husband-wife language there. And so it's maybe option two is that Paul is specifically telling women they can't question their husband's prophecy during church service. Not just any, anybody's prophecy, just their husbands in particular. Because uh, Greek is one of those funny languages, there's lots of languages like that, some still spoken like French, that does not have a difference between the word woman and wife. It's the same word in Greek. And so when you see the word women, it sometimes can be translated wives. And so Paul could be saying, wives, be silent when your husband is teaching. Wouldn't that make sense if the overall passage is how to keep church service orderly and decent and keep out of fights? Because what's a great way to cause a fight? If a husband and wife start fighting over who's right, right? <laughs> and so it could be Paul is, is not commanding women, stop talking. He could be saying, wives, don't interrogate your husbands during service. That, that could be an interpretation of this. I think that is a legit one. I think either one of those two options would make sense of this passage. And they still allow us for saying, Paul is saying something, Scripture is still useful. It falls under the umbrella of the whole category of what this passage is talking about, and it's not contradictory with what came three chapters earlier or what comes throughout the rest of the New Testament. And so the two options are either, one, women cannot judge another person's prophecy in the service, or two, more specifically perhaps, women cannot judge their husband's prophecy during the service. I think either one of those uh, options are good here. Uh, Paul does, though, put some kind of restriction on women or wives during church gatherings here. He does. There is restriction on them that he doesn't give to men. He does do that uh, here. But he doesn't say that they can't ever talk, I don't think. He just places a restriction there, and I don't think it's cultural. I think it's pretty standard because, again, there are those phrases that Paul says, this is how all churches do it, and if you don't do it this way, you're not accepted. That's how Paul actually outright states it uh, here in this passage. Uh, that there, that's very timeless language. That does not sound like culturally bound language to me. Uh, that seems very timeless to me. But we also got to be clear that Paul is not saying that women aren't allowed to ever speak up during a church service because that would contradict so much other stuff that's written too. But he is teaching something here. And now this leads us to bigger questions like women preachers uh, and things such as that, but I'm, we'll deal with that another time. You can talk to me privately if you want because... Uh, I don't have another 45 minutes to go on. There's other verses that, that I think can be brought up. Um, but Nathaniel's only making me talk about 1 Corinthians 14, so we're not going to Timothy uh, tonight. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up with just three reminders of what I've already said that will hopefully kind of tie some things together. Uh, first, I think that the interpretation of this passage, the specifics of it, are matters of opinion. You can still be Christian and view things differently uh, than me on this. I'm, I'm not going to say that you're being heretical unless I can figure out that you're purposefully ignoring what you think is the interpretation, because then you are being wrong, right? So you, you can't just say, I don't like it, so I'm not going to do it. You actually have to interpret. Uh, second uh, point here, Paul is teaching something in the passage. Your interpretation of it cannot be, I don't like what he's teaching and therefore it can't be right. Like that's a terrible way to read scripture. And so you're, it can't be there. There are other things in the Bible that I don't like, but as a Christian, I'm supposed to do them anyway. And so, like, even when there's interpretations that are like, oh, this is hard, figure it out, right? So that, that's how it goes. And so my opinion on this passage is that Paul is restricting women, maybe not all women, it might just be wives, I go back and forth on the interpretation there, uh, from judging prophecy openly during service. And that is an authority-type role that Paul does restrict to men, it seems like, here. 
Uh, if you disagree, show me the interpretation. Don't just say you're wrong. Uh, third here, don't mistake the forest for the trees. Uh, the forest is that this passage is teaching us that God wants his services. He wants when the Christians get together, the gatherings of those that love him. He wants that to be orderly, and he wants it to be mutually mutual blessing for everyone involved. He does not want it to be chaos, and he does not want it to be disorderly. When someone shows up, God wants that person who just shows up to be able to figure out what's going on and hear truth during it, not be confused or be scared. And that's what's supposed to happen uh, there. And so with that third point, I need to ask the most important question question of any biblical study is, so what? And that really is the most important question you ask of any text you interpret, is so what? Uh, do I now have like good head knowledge that allows me to argue for better or for worse about one church's interpretation of these verses, and I can tell them why they're wrong, or yay, my church is great now, I do things the right way? That's not what interpreting it's for. You're supposed to ask, so what? So what do I do about this? Uh, how do I take this? And so it just a lot of us can't decide a lot of things for how churches run, but we can ask ourselves this, and that is, how, what can I do to make church services more orderly and less chaotic? What could I do? Where can I volunteer? Where can I step in for when the church gets together that I can help use my gifts to make the church a more orderly, a more decent, an easier place to be for others who come in and need to hear some truth? So that's what we get out of this passage. And yeah, there's a whole lot of details that can get really angry, right? Uh, but the overarching thing is should, we should be asking ourselves, what can I do to help out church services? Where can I step in to make things work out better? That's what we should be asking ourselves about this passage. Uh, please pray with me. Father, I thank you for the chance to gather and to study your word, even if it is one of those passages that I, I know for a fact a lot of Christians say I wish weren't even in there. But God, may we be able to use sound judgment. May we be able to look at it peaceably. May we not directly contradict the teaching of the passage as we discuss it with other Christians. And instead, uh, take away how can I help uh, make your services, make your gatherings of those who love you, uh, make them a better place, a better way to worship you, and help others to follow after you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.